Hello, my name is Kevin Thompson and I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the Davis McGrath IP webinar series. Um, today's uh, presentation is going to be on common trademark application problems. The recording and slides uh, will be available of at uh, the address shown here on your screen, which is our, our blog website at blog.davismcgrath.com slash webinars. The, the slides and the recordings and uh, the cases that I'll be talking about today will be available there as well. Um, our next webinar is coming up on December 7th, and uh, what um, the uh, topic will be is uh, copyright registration for online works in which I'm calling Online Works, Copyright Registration and Enforcement. So today, we're going to go for about 30 minutes, and uh, we will be covering trademark application process highlights and uh, talk about some different types of refusals and provide some examples as well. Uh, it's sort of helpful to talk about these not just in the abstract, but you know, provide sort of an a explanation of how this all, all, work, all works out. So quite simply, uh, the trademark application process begins with an application, which is the box over here on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, the USPTO charges a fee for between 275 to 325 per class, which is the fee for the review of your application. Now that review is done during the examination process, oh, excuse me, which is about three to six months uh, after the application is filed, and if uh, examiner believes that a refusal is in order, uh, you have six months to respond. Uh, if you do respond to the examiner and uh, the examiner doesn't uh, agree with your arguments, that uh, refusal will then become final, at which point then your choices are either to allow the application to lapse or to uh, appeal to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. Assuming that uh, application uh, does go forward, the next step is publication which is right here in the process, uh, which is 30 days for third parties to oppose or seek an extension of time. And then if it's a use-based registration, uh, uh, registration will be the next step. Otherwise, if it's an intent to use, it goes through the notice of allowance process, which we won't really talk about today. Now, the refusals uh, that I'm going to be talking about, uh, well, they there are in three general categories. Uh, the first is what I call the avoidable issues, such as ownership, ornamentation, use in commerce, or consent of a living individual. And the next step uh, would be uh, common refusals, which are likely to confusion or dis descriptiveness. And then the third category here, which are the totally uncommon types of refusals, such as geographic refusals, uh, flags or protected symbols, surnames, uh, deceptive trademarks, uh, ones that are deceptively misdescriptive, and those that are immoral or scandalous. And we certainly have examples of all of those today. Uh, the first big one is ownership. Uh, it's quite simply an application that's filed in the name of the wrong individual, uh, the wrong owner, is simply just void. And um, that certainly is done, excuse me, uh, certainly is done as uh, part of the application process. Uh, it it's certainly is a good good idea to really carefully look at uh, who is the owner. Uh, it certainly comes up uh, during uh, cancellation proceedings quite often. People look at ownership as one way to knock uh, an application out. And one thing to be certainly be careful of is that intent to use applications can be signed only as part of the underlying business uh, that is expressed by the by the by the trademark. Uh, in, intent to use applications, uh, uh, the reason there's a restriction on that is uh, the US, under U.S. law, it is uh, forbidden to traffic in trademarks. And so, um, you know, one, one, one company may have the bona fide intent to use the mark and they can't just sell it willy-nilly. Uh, the next major topic for uh, the uh, common issues is ornamentation. Um, these are certainly is an avoidable issue. Um, you have to use a trademark to identify the source of particular goods or services and not merely as a design element on the goods. 
And this most happens often in uh, applications that are filed in Class 25 for t-shirts and hats or other clothing items. Those are certainly very good common examples of where you might see an ornamentation type refusal. And the best practice in this case uh, would be to uh, have a specimen in which uh, the mark is used on a hang tag, uh, such as um, you know those little uh, tags that are attached, you know, with little plastic screws to uh, to the, the clothing item, uh, which certainly would be uh, able to uh, show the mark as as used, uh, and it's not merely a design inlet on the uh, on the particular clothing item. Um, the next one would be use in commerce. Um, a trademark must be used in the ordinary course of trade. And uh, one thing to keep in mind for services is that it must be a service for the benefit of others. It can't be uh, for your own benefit. And it also must not be in use as an expected service as part of other services. For example, bagging groceries at the grocery store uh, is sort of an expected service, especially if you're applying for grocery store services. Um, and so that certainly is uh, one uh, type of refusal that uh, could come up with for use in commerce. The next one is sort of a fun one, which is the consent of a living individual. And I went out and found this case, which is uh, from In Ray Richard Heflin, which is the decision regarding three trademark applications that Mr. Heflin filed. Uh, shortly before the uh, inauguration of uh, President Barack Obama, in which case he tried to apply for Obama Bahama pajamas, Obama pajamas, and Barack's jocks dressed to the left. And uh, he actually tried to argue that did not refer to President Obama, uh, but the board didn't quite believe him on that particular point. I tried to uh, submit evidence of uh, uh, the, the common meaning of the word Obama. Uh, but uh, since he'd also applied for the word Barack at the same time, uh, they certainly didn't believe that uh, that particular argument. And um, uh, quite simply, uh, if you do uh, apply for a trademark in the name of a particular individual, uh, you actually do have to make a record that that living individual consents. Um, and so that that's why this particular application, these three applications actually were refused. And it should also be noted that uh, presidents uh, do actually, uh, that th their names do have special protection under U.S. trademark law um, for their life of the president and also during the life of the president's widow. Uh, the uh, tr uh, president's name cannot be used as a trademark uh, without the consent of the president or uh, the widow. Uh, turning now to the major uh, most common types. Uh, well, first, we're going to talk about likely to confusion. Uh, this uh, happens quite often, and that happens when you're trying to file a trademark application in which uh, there is something already on file uh, which the trademark office believes is uh, confusingly similar to uh, something that's already on record. And um, uh, when evaluating the likely to confusion, there are actually 13 factors that the court looks at. It comes from a famous case called In Re E. I. Dupont de, de Moors. Uh, we call them generally the, call them the Dupont factors. And the most common of these are the similarity of appearance, sound, connotation, and commercial impression, um, similarity to goods and or services, uh, similarity of trade channels, and then also the conditions under which sales are made. Uh, the example here would be uh, an impulse purchase uh, might be uh, more likely to be confused versus uh, a sophisticated purchaser that might take more time to sit down and compare uh, two particular applications. Uh, the first example comes from the case In Ray CSI Collision Specialist Inc. in which uh, the original our registration was for uh, vehicle body repair services and um, the application it was in class 37 also as well for repair and maintenance of gas engines, gas compression equipment, electronic ignition control equipment, lubrication and emission control equipment. And the board looked at it uh, after the uh, examiner issued a refusal, a final refusal that went up to the board 
And uh, in this particular case, uh, the board actually overturned the refusal, which is quite interesting uh, because the marks are uh, effectively uh, quite similar. One is f for the design, incorporating the word CSI. The other one is CSI. Um, and uh, uh, what uh, tripped uh, made the, made the board decide that there was not sufficient uh, confusion here uh, was the fact that vehicle body repair services uh, was distinct from the uh, services of repairing and maintenance of gas engines. And at this point, uh, gas engines are uh, normally uh, actually industrial. You, when you hear of gas, you might think of automobiles, but that's not what this is. This is uh, uh, turbines or some other sort of, of gas engine uh, used in an industrial context. And um, in that case, uh, vehicle body repair services and gas engines would uh, certainly be in quite distinct uh, areas. And uh, the court, uh, sorry, the, the board also looked at, uh, you know, the general weakness of the term CSI. And in this case, while they were related, um, they weren't related enough uh, for there to be sufficient confusion. So I thought that was a particularly interesting one to point out. Uh, just to give you a, a an example of the kinds of refusals, I picked up another one for likelihood of confusion. And in this case, um, the applicant is for uh, Park Lane, uh, which is for le leather and imitation, leather bags and handbags, as well as uh, articles of clothing and uh, other uh, items in Class 25. Whereas there's a registration of Park Avenue in design for uh, women's hoisery and footwear. and uh, Again, this is one that went up to the board uh, after receiving a, a final refusal from the examiner. And in this case, uh, while there there are certainly similarity in meanings, uh, a lane versus an avenue are both different kinds of streets. Uh, they both have the common element park. Um, in this case, uh, uh, what uh, made the board decide that there was not uh, a confusion here is uh, is that there's overall a different different commercial impression between Park Lane and Park Avenue, and uh, there was a showing of of some weakness of the term park, and um, there was a sufficient different commercial impression caused uh, by Park Lane, uh, which could be meaning um, a particular uh, uh, street. Uh, I believe in in London uh, versus Park Avenue, which uh, would generally be the uh, one of the main shopping thoroughfares in New York, and so just a totally different uh, commercial impression. Uh, descriptiveness is another good one. Uh, it comes up comes up a lot. Uh, that's why I included it in my my category of of common refusals. Uh, just briefly, uh, there's four elements uh, for four particular types of trademarks, uh, ranging uh, of its of its strength. The most strong would be a coined mark, um, you know, such as Kodak. And uh, a suggestive mark is uh, the next level down below that. That's one where it takes some semblance of thought to figure out just what it is it, it relates to, such as Apple for computers. Uh, descriptive is the next level below that, and descriptive remarks uh, cannot be registered on their own on the principal register uh, without showing of, of some, some element of, of acquired distinctiveness. And then the next level below that would be generic, uh, such as a, a, a common term, um, escalator uh, is now a generic term, even though it was once a trademark. Um, that's another issue which <laughs> we're not going to be covering today. But uh, trademark can become generic if you're not careful. Um, and so we're talking here about descriptiveness, which is the the, the third level. And um, in this case, uh, the the mark that was applied for was Mega Sampler for cigars in Class 34. And this, uh, again, was refused and went up to the board. And in this case, uh, the board overturned the refusal. It, they, they looked at it and said, sampler is, is indeed a uh, generic term for, uh, obviously, a, a collection or a, a sampling of a, a particular uh, type, in this case, uh, a sampling of cigars. Uh, but the mega term uh, was found to be uh, somewhat suggestive um, 
and uh, uh, arbitrary in that uh, it is um, uh, used as a, almost a laudatory type term uh, to um, emphasize uh, perhaps the size, uh, but it's used more as a, as a, as a, la a laudatory term. And in this case, you know, when it was combined together, uh, the board believed uh, that it was just not descriptive enough uh, to be, uh, you know, subject to that type of refusal when it was actually suggestive. Um, and in this case, um, the, um, the, there was also some third-party evidence that the examiner had tried to show of, of use of mega sampler, and in this case, they were able to prove uh, to the board uh, that in actuality, what the what the examiner had found uh, was actually uh, third-party uses of uh, uh, this this company's mark. Um, they were resellers of uh, of these particular mega sampler products, and so even though there was a lot of use of mega sampler for cigars. It was used by uh, by the applicant, and so uh, that was uh, one factor to show acquired distinctiveness. Um, the next major topic, uh, which we'll get into, are some of the more uncommon refusals. I had a big long list of those, if you remember from the chart I had at the beginning. Um, geographic refusals are the one that, that come up uh, somewhat more often. In that case, um, there's two particular kinds of geographic refusals. Uh, the first is when the mark is primarily geographically descriptive, and that means uh, that there is uh, some sort of goods place association uh, between uh, the, the place and, and the product, and uh, it's, it's merely used in a descriptive fashion in, in the application. Um, and then uh, the next type is primarily primarily geographically deceptively misdescriptive, in which case is that there is that normal uh, geographic association, uh, but in this case uh, the marks don't actually come from that place, and so um, you might think of uh, Germany for beer, and uh, if the beer doesn't actually come from Germany, uh, then that could be a deceptively misdescriptive mark. Uh, and examples of these, uh, the, the the mark is actually pronounced uh, Vintuk. Vintuk is a city in Nambia. This are Namibia. Uh, Vintuk Lager and Vintuk Light uh, were the marks that were applied for, and uh, they, they received a final refusal from the examiner uh, for. Um, uh, being geographically descriptive and that they, they, they came from the place. Um, but uh, in this particular case, the board looked at it and said that there really isn't a goods place association between the city of Vinthook and beer. Uh, they might be locally famous for, for beer, which it turns out they are, they are. The examiner had evidence of that. But uh, there was no evidence that uh, uh, people inside the United States uh, would normally um, think of uh, Ventuk, Namibia, as, as a location to purchase beer from. And so as a result, uh, it was not primarily geographically descriptive, and uh, so the uh, refusal was overturned. Uh, the next one we're going to talk about is um, a deceptively misdescriptive refusal. And the application was for London, Soho, New York, by the Conair Corporation, for primarily for cosmetic bags in Class 18. And in this case, um, uh, the examiner had looked at it and said that there was a uh, primarily geographic significance between uh, London and New York, and uh, the goods apparently did not originate from either London or New York. Um, and in this case, uh, it went up to the board again, uh, and again, this mark was, was overturned. Uh, the refusal was overturned. Um, the, the board looks at it uh, and, and accepted the, uh, the applicant's argument that uh, Soho is a, a particular uh, neighborhood in, that exists in both London and in New York, and uh, focusing on the center park of the mark Soho uh, with London Soho and New York Soho, uh, sort of implied there, neither one of those two places uh, was actually known for cosmetic bags. 
Uh, they might be known for other fashion items. Uh, they might be known for uh, other, uh, you know, primarily uh, sort of a, a hipster lifestyle, uh, but they weren't necessarily known for cosmetic bags. And so uh, the, the board overturned that particular refusal. Uh, the next one that comes up is uh, flags and protected symbols. Uh, this happens a lot. Uh, it simply can, uh, cannot be uh, applied for uh, a mark that includes a, a protected symbol such as a state flag, a, a country flag, or um, a protected symbol such as uh, the Red Cross symbol or, or the Olympic rings or other Olympic symbol. And in this case, uh, this um, in Ray Serta Pro Painters Limited application, uh, which was uh, for, um, I believe, uh, house painting services, uh, it was originally refused by the by the examiner because if you look at the mark, uh, it contains the maple leaf and the upright uh, block on the right, which is on the the right, essentially the right hand side of the Canadian flag. Uh, the full Canadian flag also has a similar shaped bar also on the left. And so the examiner refused it because it was a simulation of the flag. And, uh, and as a result, um, it, could, it could not be registered. In this case, the, the board looked at it and uh, distinguished it from uh, the cases in which uh, they were uh, trying to uh, appear to be a flag. Uh, there's no border around uh, that particular part of the um, uh, part of the mark to make it look like you know they're trying to make it look like a flag like it's got a wavy line or other indication to show it's like a flag waving um, and it does not show the entire flag it only shows part of it um, and uh, only has certain uh, essentially uh, uh, removed elements that normally would be in them in the flag uh, and as a result, uh, again, the board overturned this particular refusal. Uh, the next particular topic that comes up is uh, surname refusals. And it's quite simply, uh, uh, somebody's uh, last name uh, cannot be a trademark if you simply apply for it by itself. In this case, uh, the, the examiner refused uh, registration of the mark PJ Fitzpatrick, comma, Inc., for roofing services and other uh, construction related services in class 37 uh, because Fitzpatrick was a surname and merely adding the ink uh, to it uh, would not uh, make it um, you know distinctive it's it's, it's sort of a, a common element uh, uh, that's not protected on its own and so this PJ Fitzpatrick ink was refused well it went up to the board and the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board looked at it and uh, pointed out that uh, it's not just Fitzpatrick, comma, Inc. And if that was all the, the, they'd applied for, the board makes a point of knowing that that simply would have been also upheld. But in this case, it's not just the last name. It's got the initials PJ in front of it. So PJ Fitzpatrick, comma, Inc. It's not primarily a, sur a surname. Uh, so that particular element uh, in addition to the ink, uh, which normally would not have been enough on its own, uh, was enough in this particular instance for the board uh, to believe uh, that uh, the people would not look at it and believe it's merely merely the, the person's last name. This one's actually a fun one. Uh, these uh, this particular refusals I'm talking about here are deceptive refusals and deceptively misdescriptive refusals. It uh, doesn't have anything to do with uh, geography like we talked about before, uh, but these are, are ones in which there is some, uh, some deceptiveness uh, uh, that's alleged uh, as a result of this application. And uh, what was refused was a mark center rib steak for meats, namely beef and beef steaks, as well as online catalog retail services uh, featuring these beef and beef steaks products. Um, and so the Allen brothers received this refusal uh, from the examiner and took it up to the board. Uh, the reason that they received the refusal is because uh, center rib is a particular cut, but not for beef. Uh, I feel sort of like uh, the, the old uh, David Letterman uh, 
uh, uh, skit where he's always uh, uh, asking people, know your cuts of meat. <laughs> uh, in this particular case, uh, center rib is, is, a, uh, is a pork cut, not a beef cut. And so uh, the examiner looked at it and believed a center rib steak, people would be expecting pork. And in fact, they'd be getting beef. And uh, so uh, that's why it was is deceptive and also a deceptively misdescriptive refusal. Well, it went up to the, to the board and uh, the board looked at it. And uh, in this case, what they believed was that uh, the examiner did not prove that the term when applied to beef would be misdescriptive. I mean, it's, it's certainly uh, there could be a, a rib that could be cut from the center of beef as, as well as uh, well as pork. And while it's not a normal cut for, for beef, uh, it's, it certainly could be uh, one that, that, uh, that could happen. And so in this particular case, uh, the board overturned this particular refusal. Um, so we're going to get into uh, some of the really interesting fun ones uh, which are immoral or scandalous marks now and I'm going to show you the first one uh, which is uh, it's a design of a bottle uh, for beers and other alcoholic beverages in classes 32 and 33 and it's design of a bottle that's in the shape of an upright uh, raised middle finger and um, uh, the board looked at it. It's it's a very interesting opinion, um, uh, because uh, they, they sort of try to explain, you know, just why is the the middle finger uh, a vulgar term? Uh, it goes on for about twenty pages. Uh, it's it's very interesting reading, um, but in this case, a, uh, a substantial composite of the general public would believe that this term would be vulgar, and therefore scandalous. Uh, especially if they uh, came across this uh, in a design in a uh, in a store, uh, they'd see it uh, and uh, you know find it vulgar and therefore scandalous. And so uh, registration was refused. Uh, I do have another example though of uh, one that was overturned, and that's this one. Uh, the mark was cocktails uh, for. Um, uh, monologues about sex, sexuality, and the male experience. Uh, essentially, a uh, uh, a male version. Uh, I'm familiar with the the, the monologues, the, the vagina monologues that deal with the, the female experience. And in this case, uh, it's for nightclub entertainment events and entertainment exhibitions in terms of live readings of plays and stories. Uh, essentially, you know, these monologues. And in this case, uh, the board overturned the refusal. Uh, because uh, the um, while it was somewhat vulgar in the 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 the, the cock portion of the mark, uh, the tails portion of it together uh, bumped it slightly into the suggestive category, and um, and then um, there was also the double entendre uh, because it's going to be done in a nightclub, uh, the the cocktail drink, uh, sort of a, a play on that particular word. And so uh, when viewed in its entirety, uh, the board believed uh, that uh, it was not uh, sufficiently uh, vulgar enough uh, to be, ter be termed immoral or scandalous in, in today's society. So uh, that one was just decided this February. Well, uh, we're at the point where we certainly uh, covered uh, all of the major uh, topics. Um, is there any questions that people have? Uh, if you uh, would like to ask one now, now would be a good time. Uh, the uh, the software allows you to uh, you know, put your question in, and uh, we will see uh, whether or not I have an answer. Well, nothing's showing up so far, so I'm just going to presume that people don't have questions. If you do have questions uh, and you didn't want to ask it during the webinar, please uh, feel free to contact me. I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the recording will be available on the website. And uh, our next webinar is coming up on December 7th on online works, copyright registration, and enforcement. Uh, so protection for online works for copyright. Um, 
I want to thank everybody for coming and uh, for uh, and for attending. Thank you so much.